Tim, welcome today. It's uh, it's great to have you uh, join us with our community, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you very much, Simon. Thanks for this introduction, and it's great to speak to to this audience as well. Uh, I'm going to dive straight in and uh, share my screen, um, and then we will be up and running. I'm hoping that you can see a full screen um, image. This is Marmalade Lane in Cambridge. And uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is this idea of uh, child-friendly neighborhoods. What are they? Uh, why do they matter? And how can we uh, make neighborhoods more child-friendly? And I think when we're thinking about children's relationship with the places that they grow up in, it's helpful to think about our own childhoods um, and how uh, that th those relationships have changed over time. Um, and this next slide, my first slide really, I think brings, uh, encapsulates one key aspect of those changes. So what you're looking at is a map of what you might call the roaming range um, or the home territory of four children. Uh, they're all eight years old, but they're in four generations of the same family who all grew up in the same city. So this big blob that you can see that takes up most of the map, that's the roaming range of the great grandfather in his family at the age of eight. Uh, and he could go six miles across the city on his own. And then you can see how the, uh, the, the circles shrink with each generation until we end up here with the sun, the yellow dot up at the top left. Um, and he's actually able to uh, go to the end of his street that's more everyday freedom, more of a kind of license to roam than most eight-year-olds are given. But, but what this image encapsulates is, is what I call the shrinking horizons of childhood. And it's, a, it's, I think, one of the most profound and one of the most underexplored changes in, in children's lives. Um, and clearly very central to their, to their everyday activity. Um, now, uh, I hope you'll kind of see that this, this you grasp the importance of this, particularly for your work, but you may be asking yourselves why this has happened. Well, it's a complicated picture, but I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that one of the reasons and the, a, a main reason is the physical uh, nature of the environments that children are growing up in today. I, as I say, it's not the only factor, but it's a pretty important one and crucially the growing dominance of the car. And that's a thing that I will come back to. But this story also I think speaks to children's appetite for exploration. Um, you know, ch when children, as children grow up, they want to get to grips with the world around, they want to explore, they have an appetite uh, for life and, um, you know, they don't want to be uh, corralled and uh, kept out of what's happening around them. Um, and that's part of what growing up involves. And it's also, of course, of course, good for children, it's not just good for their bodies, it's good for their all around development as well. So if we take a moment to ask ourselves, actually, what is the standard way that we cater for children's appetite for experience and for movement uh, as they're growing up in the neighborhoods uh, where they live? And the standard response to that, I'm afraid, looks rather like this. OK, this is a particularly dismal example, but I mean, it, it's, it's only a poor example of the standard model. Um, that we, we meet children's appetite for, for, for moving and play in neighbourhoods by creating uh, uh, reservations like this one. And uh, my book and my work uh, really is, is trying to get as far away from this model of the child reservation model as possible. So uh, the talk I'm going to give you runs like this. I'm going to say what I think child-friendly urban planning is, uh, why I think it matters, why it's important, especially to decision makers, a few case studies and then some thoughts on making it happen. And it's really a whistle stop tour of my book, Urban Playground. And it also, the book and my work draws heavily on about a dozen cities. And these are all cities that have taken seriously the goal of making neighborhoods uh, more child friendly. And um, they've moved beyond one off uh, engagement studies or, or pilots and actually put some serious time and money into this objective. You can see they're quite a mix of cities um, and that was deliberate. So I think you, you know, you're quite likely to find towns and cities that have some similarities with where you're working. So what is child-friendly urban planning? 
Um, this diagram that you're looking at is most important in my book, uh, and it's, it, it shows a kind of two-dimensional framework. Um, the two key uh, dimensions that come together to make neighbourhoods in physical terms work well or not for children. So what are those two dimensions? Well, the first dimension is what you might call the things to do dimension. Uh, a neighbourhood that, that, that um, gets children out and active and, and having fun and enjoying themselves is a neighbourhood where there's lots of choice and variety of spaces and places. But that's not the only dimension. There's also the child mobility dimension. Crucially, how easy is it in a neighbourhood for children to get around on their own, uh, walking and cycling? And um, so let's unpack that uh, framework a little bit more. So you can live in a neighborhood, you can imagine neighborhoods where uh, it's not very easy to get around, but even if you could get around, there's very little to do. And actually the kind of monofunctional sprawling suburb is a pretty good example of that. Um, you can also imagine neighborhoods uh, where it might be quite easy to get around and there might be some sort of density, but, but the uh, children's ability to get around only reveals to them uh, the sterility and boredom of where they're living growing up. And an extreme example of that might be a refugee camp like this one. Conversely, uh, you can imagine and we can see neighbourhoods where on the face of it, there's lots to do. There's lots of activity. There's lots of life. Uh, this is a sky, uh, an aerial view of the image of Recife in Brazil. Uh, and like uh, a city I've been lucky enough to visit and like many Brazilian cities, very lively uh, beachfront, uh, lots going on. And, and in fact, um, families live in these blocks here, especially the, the blocks one block back uh, are, they're not hotels, they are apartment blocks where middle-class Brazilian families live. Um, but those families and the children live incredibly constrained um, and dependent lives. So, uh, you know, they're ferried everywhere by adults, often in cars. So for those children, um, this beach may as well be miles away. Uh, and their experience is, is, is uh, of, of looking at the city through a glass house or through a windscreen. Um, and it's only where you have both high levels of mobility, uh, children can get around on foot or by bike, even quite young children, and a good mix of places and spaces to go that you're in that child-friendly quadrant. So let's, let's make that real and concrete with an example, which uh, a real neighbourhood, which in my book I suggest could be the ultimate child-friendly neighbourhood. And it's the eco-suburb of Vauban, uh, which is on the outskirts of Freiburg in Germany. So it was a former military base. Uh, it's a mixed use, medium density development that was, that was created over the 1990s and 2000s. About five or 6,000 people live there. Um, so it's pretty, it's a decent size. You can see from that aerial, it's apartment living. Uh, the crucial thing that marks out Vauban from other similar uh, developments is that it's in effect car free. Um, so you can own a car if you live in Vauban, but if you do, um, you can't park it outside your apartment. You have to park it uh, elsewhere. And in fact, there are very low levels of car ownership. So let's take a slightly closer look. You can see an image at street level um, on the right there. Um, one of the interesting things about Vauban, it's a, it's a pretty green neighborhood. There's lots of green space, um, but actually there aren't very many uh, fenced off segregated play areas. What you see instead is that play offers and invitations like this one are woven into the public realm um, and also very, very well placed so that there, there's always, um, it's easy access from, from dwellings and there's good informal oversight. Um, this is a, a slide of the streets, of course, because the streets are uh, more or less car free, um, then they're full of life. Um, so you really do see um, uh, images like this. I've been lucky enough to visit Vauban twice. Here's a couple more images of uh, some of the space between the buildings. Um, on the left, actually, that was a pretty chilly early March afternoon, um, but you can see it's absolutely full of uh, families getting out and enjoying the space. Um, but there's a real variety of spaces in the, in the neighbourhood as well. And here's just an image um, that brings home some of the kind of uh, ways of reducing the car dependence. That, on the left is one of the garages. There are three multi-story garages on the periphery of the district. And on the right, you can see the great public transport that, that uh, really reduces families' needs for the car. And there's also, of course, good walking and cycling infrastructure. So if you pull all that together, uh, and this is a diagram from my book, 
uh, I'm not going to explain this in lots of detail, but in effect, you've got a kind of uh, the spine the, 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 it is a sort of a, a compact, sustainable uh, mixed use development of the kind that's familiar to progressive urbanists. But then you have a child friendly layer on top of that, where you just got that extra thought given to how you can make spaces playful, uh, how you can think about children's mobility, how you can think about teenagers. And it's 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 those two things coming together that I think uh, really lift Vauban. OK, so that's the picture I want you to have in your mind of a kind of lighthouse or a, a, a compass point, a, a direction of travel. Why does this matter? Now, when I visited the cities that I studied for the book, I really wanted to find out from decision makers why they were investing in this idea. And the, the answers came into, broadly speaking, three headings. So there is a cluster of cities that were interested directly in children's health and development. And you can see that's this circle of cities here. There was a group of cities that were interested in sustainability and community uh, and really grasping the idea that if we ask ourselves, what does a child friendly neighborhood look like? It looks a lot like a sustainable neighborhood. I'll come back to that. That's another cluster. And then there was a cluster of cities who actually had quite hard nosed economic reasons for being interested. They were worried about their economies. They were worried about their demographics. Um, in short, they realized that you know, if they didn't manage to attract and retain families, um, then their long term prospects uh, were not great. So I'm just going to say a bit more about each of these um, rationales now. Um, starting with children and child health, I'm speaking to you from London. Uh, I, I, I'm, take, I'm ashamed to tell you that London is a city where we saw a landmark case. You may be familiar with it. So this is um, Ella. Ella Adu Kissy Deborah, and she died about um, in 2013. Uh, and uh, it eventually uh, emerged through an inquest that air pollution, largely caused by living uh, very close to the South Circular, uh, was a main cause of death. And that's the first case of air pollution being cited uh, on a child death certificate. Um, and it really speaks to uh, the extent to which poor planning. Uh, ha, ha, has a real and sometimes tragic impact on children. Um, I also want to talk about another uh, to, uh, 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 area where tragedy looms, and that's road danger. Um, and globally, uh, children and young adults, uh, road danger is the leading cause of death. It, not so much in high income countries, but still even here in England, uh, if you look at where children aged five to 14 are dying, one in 10 of those deaths are happening on the roads um, and, and there's a very strong uh, social gradient with the poorest children being most uh, affected. And I just want to kind of zoom in on that image you can see here. I think uh, really we, we, if we wanted to create neighbourhoods and environments that fostered activity and movement and play in children, we could hardly do worse than introduce large, fast moving, uh, metal objects everywhere. And, 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 and I think one of the goals of my work is to try and get people to see that, because I think it's, we've, we've normalized car centric planning so deeply that it's quite hard to get beyond it. But I think once you start to see how prevalent it is, look, this child here whose hand is being held by their mother, because if that child takes a step, a foot in the wrong direction, their lives are in grave danger. That's, that's one of the messages of my book. And I think it's a vital um, aspect of the work that you're doing. Um, of course, we know about child obesity, um, but maybe it's not always clear just how rapidly child obesity has grown. Um, only uh, just about 50 years ago, hardly any children were clinically obese. Um, and now we're seeing levels uh, that, that are many times greater than they were then. Um, this is an astonishing change. And of course, there are various factors, but one of them is uh, declines in physical activity uh, and particularly habitual physical activity because of the neighborhoods that children are growing up. On a positive note, uh, we know that children's play is valuable and healthy. Um, and in fact, this uh, international study showed that children who play out every day um, have much higher satisfaction levels. They're, they're happier in themselves than children who don't. And that's a study going across 18 16 or 18 different European countries. 
Uh, and just this infographic just reminds you of some of the physical benefits of outdoor play, um, uh, which are many and varied. Um, I now want to turn away from children and look at that sustainability argument. Um, and as I said, I think if we if we sort of put out the, the, the key components of child friendly cities or neighborhoods, they're compact, they're easy to get around on foot or by bike, they're green and paper, uh, playful, and people care about children. If we then ask ourselves, okay, so what do sustainable cities or neighborhoods look like? It's it's practically identical. Okay, and if we want to build the case for more sustainable places, which we really have an urgent need to do, then joining the dots between sustainability and child friendliness uh, is a powerful way to do that. Again, I'll come back to that. Finally, I want to talk about children's views themselves. And whenever we take the time to ask children what they like and don't like about neighbourhoods, you can see the summary there. Uh, what they tell us matches very neatly onto this two dimensional framework that I've been setting out. So you pull all that together and you get this insight from uh, former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalos, that children are kind of indicator species for cities. And I really like that that figure of speech that just in the same way that if you see salmon swimming up a river, that's a sign of the health of that habitat. If you see children of different ages with and without their parents, active, playing, being visible in nurseries like I did in Vauban, then that's a sign of the health of that human habitat. So case studies, Rotterdam. I devote a whole chapter of my book to Rotterdam. And what's interesting about Rotterdam is it, it grasps the economic challenges. There was a survey about 15 years ago that showed Rotterdam was the worst city in the Netherlands to bring up a child. And the city realized that was a problem. And it devoted significant resources over a significant time with a lot of thought into transforming the physical uh, environments of residential neighborhoods. Um, so uh, I'm going to speed up now because I'm conscious of time, but just to take one neighborhood, a group of agencies came together to carry out a set of interventions on streets, in schoolyards, in public spaces, uh, sports facilities, uh, to, to both improve mobility in this neighborhood and also extend the set of offers. Um, and what uh, here's one example of, of what's happening in Rotterdam. Where possible, they're actually taking out parking from one side of residential streets, widening the pavement, um, and that's creating a kind of doorstep play opportunity. And that is part of policy um, in the city. Um, we're also seeing naturalized schoolyards and also opening up schoolyards for use out of school hours, because of course that's a much, uh, well, you know, why should, be, why should these spaces be sitting idle when schools are closed? Uh, there's now planning policy that brings some of this into practice that actually looks at neighborhoods in a holistic way. And what the city found was that they did indeed uh, get more families moving into their target neighborhoods. So as far as they were concerned, that big picture policy uh, was being addressed. Um, I'm going to briefly highlight London. There's a few uh, interesting things happening, not quite at the strategic level, but the London plan has got some strong policies around planning, particularly biting in new developments. A couple of local authorities, Hackney and Tower Hamlets, have written a supplementary planning guidance that, that talk about child-friendly developments. Um, there are some case studies, King's Crescent, well, an acclaimed mixed development. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth Park has got some great public spaces in particular, and EC1 is a really interesting example of a retrofit project that ran during the Labour government's New Deal programme between about 2004 and 2010. And I'm still taking people on walking tours around that neighborhood to show the difference that that program made. And uh, I've got a few images here um, that capture some of the physical changes that have been made in some of those case studies. A uh, couple more case studies. These, curiously, they, these are all in the east of England, but I think that's uh, not necessarily, I wouldn't read too much into that, but I wanted to, to log them for your future perusal. I talk a bit about each of these in my book. A Goldsmith Road in Ipswich, Marmalade Lane, which I've already mentioned, and Cambridge North, which is quite a big uh, development, I would say along the Vauban model that uh, we should definitely keep an eye on. So, making it happen. Again, lots in my book about this, but time is short. I talk about four building blocks. I focus on people as well as policies, and I, and I really 
tie this all together by thinking about children as a unifying lens. So the four building blocks, streets, walking cycling networks, public space and housing. And, and really a, a, an effective program at neighbourhood level will address all of those. I'm not going to say any more about too many of them because uh, time is pressing on, but I just want to flag up play streets. This, this is a model of, uh, of both kind of not through physical change, but, but programming and working with communities to open up streets maybe once a week or once a month, uh, simply by closing traffic using local volunteers for a couple of hours, not for the Queen's Jubilee or um, what, whatever, but, but simply so children can play out. So I think it's a, a powerful intervention in itself, but also um, an effective way to get people thinking and having conversations about how streets and neighbourhoods could be different. Um, my model, my, my recipe for change at the municipal level, if possible, is to really have a catalyst in a local authority who's making change happen. And then there are various hub activities, sorry, spoke activities that come around off of that hub. Um, and you can uh, have a look at that in more detail later. I did just want to flag up a really interesting program that's running that, that you in your local authority, if you're in a local authority, might want to consider. And this is the Urban 95 Academy. It's a global program bringing together teams of three officials from cities, 50 cities in each cohort all around the world uh, that, that are working to make some of the changes that I've talked about. And some uh, English authorities, including Waltham Forest, where I live, and Tower Hamlets have already taken part in that programme. My last point is to think about not children, but the other end of the age of the life path, and that's old people. And really to point out the connections between children and older people in this space. Um, actually, there are quite a lot of, of sort of if you like, characteristics of being old that are quite similar to the characteristics of being young. And you can see them listed there. So if, if we do the same sort of trick and we ask ourselves not what makes neighbours child friendly, but what makes them age friendly, um, I think you can see again, uh, it's very similar. So I think there's, again, really strong opportunities for building connections across different agendas with this programme. But I'm talking about children and like um, Chris Boardman, I believe that children are a powerful unifying lens for all of this and that he, as he says, if they're part of the messaging, it really starts to connect with people because the changes we need to make are not technical changes. They're really about changes in policies, in politics and indeed in morality. So that's the end of the whistle stop tour. Apologies for running slightly over and thanks very much. Thanks. Very much, Tim. Really, really interesting and packed full of uh, things to go back and look at. And I'm hoping that um, people will go back and check out the YouTube recording if they're after um, information from the slides. Um, uh, to Imogen now. Welcome, Imogen. And um, lovely to have you with us today. So Imogen is one of the co-founders of Make Space for Girls uh, alongside Susanna Walker. And uh, Imogen was a lawyer for many years before leaving law and uh, moving on to opportunities in the charity sector. So her work with MechSpace for Girls, um, she uh, works on, on campaigns in, in London and looking at uh, ways that uh, London can become a more age-friendly city. And uh, Imogen's a, a lifelong feminist. Um, she studied a postgraduate certificate in gender studies at uh, Birkbeck in at University of London and that reinforced her belief that if we want to make changes to the unfairness we see around us we need to campaign for structural change. So lovely to have you with us today Imogen and to share your story of Make Space for Girls. Welcome. Thank you Simon, thank you very much and thank you everybody for making time in this session because I think um, active environments, trying to make our spaces somewhere where people want to be uh, more active and teenage girls in particular feel welcome to be more active is really kind of at the heart of what we do. So what I'm going to do is see if I can get my slides up, see if I can share screen, uh, see if I can start it at the beginning. Excellent. Is that is that showing all right, Simon? Lovely. Right. Well, look, make space for teenage girls i mean this is what we are we're about making parks better for teenage girls we're a small charity and our aim is to make parks rec grounds playing fields places like that as welcoming to teenage girls as they are to teenage boys and i'll just pause because 
it may not be immediately obvious that that isn't the case now. But I'll explain a little bit about what the issues are. What it's about is it's trying to make everybody who's involved in active environments thinking about these spaces differently and recognising that if we want to encourage a more diverse group of individuals, particularly young people, to be active, we need to try some new things. And it's also about starting conversations about these spaces early and placing the voices of teenage girls sort of at the centre of what we're doing, because so often they're simply not heard. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of bits from the Active Environment Guidelines, which are coming out. Well, they're, they're at consultation. I think the consultation period ends the 10th of Feb. So this is Sports England Active Environment uh, Guidance. There are fantastic principles in there. And principle 5.5 talks about the importance of play. And there's quite a lot of play for younger children. But then there is a bullet point which says older children should also be considered. And it talks about the things that we might want to, to look at. And I think that that's absolutely right. It's very uh, common for uh, local authorities to think about play in terms of children up to about 12. But we have to recognise that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 31, that right to play is for children and young people up to the age of 18. And we have to try and understand a little bit more, I think, as an entire society about what teenage play might be and how teenage play might look. But, you know, I feel slightly embarrassed saying this in front of Tim because he's such an expert in this area. But sort of at its, its, its simplest, we can see players as behaviour that's initiated and controlled and structured by the teenagers themselves. It's not something where the teenagers are being compelled to do something. It's driven by intrinsic motivation. It's undertaken for its own sake rather than a means to an end. And it involves the exercise of autonomy. And what we're interested in here is physical activity. Um, and I think I'll just pause and just say autonomy is incredibly important for teenagers and the space to have some autonomy is very important for teenagers because actually a lot of teenagers don't have very much space where they can practice being an autonomous individual. They don't have that much at school. Um, some children may have that in their home environment, particularly if they have a, a bedroom of their own. But there are lots of children, lots of teenagers who actually don't have that. And when you talk to them about parks and spaces, actually, sometimes there's just somewhere where I can sort of be myself, where I can kind of, you know, just be me and not sort of have to sort of fit into everything else. And we've just put down the key characteristics there. Teenage players, I mentioned, a lot stops, many councils stop at age 10 to 12, and we need to think about what teenage play looks like. I mean, that's a quote from Jane Jacobs. She was writing that in 1965. But I think we have to kind of remember that. Um, you know, teenagers need places to offer them opportunities to socialize, you know, to be with people, to be with peers, to be on their own. And one of the difficulties that I think we all struggle with, particularly in the UK, is we have a tendency to see play for younger children. And we can recognise that and we know what it looks like. But actually, there's a perception that what is actually teenage play may be seen as antisocial behaviour. And there's a particularly interesting study that was done in a town where they built a skate park. And the data talked about how the skate park had reduced antisocial behaviour. But that was to a large extent due to the fact that the antisocial behaviour that was being recorded was skateboarding in the town. That had been badged as bad and antisocial behaviour. Obviously, once a skate park had been provided, that stopped to a great success. But we need to think about how we see teenage play. And I also just wanted to touch on this bit of the draft guidance, because I think 5.3 is a really important point. Plan and design for a wide range of activities and a wide range of users. And I want to come back 
when we've had a little think about what's going on at the moment, which are those first two bullet points in that draft guidance, because I think they're really critical. Sports versus play, you know, it's it's a, sometimes a very blurred line. We know what formal sports is. You know, we recognise that is when you are doing a formal game of sport. But actually, when you watch young people on a skate park or young people on a multi-use games area, yes, they're being active. Yes, they are engaging with um, a tool for their activity, be it a ball, be it a skateboard, be it a, a scooter. Are they actually doing sport? I'd say no, they're being physically active. When you watch young people using the Mooga in free form, they are, they are pretending they're scoring the winning goal, aren't they? They're messing about, they're bumping into each other, they're, they're throwing hoops, you know, as many times as they possibly can. What they're doing is, is probably not sport, it's physical activity, it's fun. Um, sport and the badging of things as sport, this is work that was done by uh, women in sport, showed that particularly among non-sporty girls, uh, there was just this sense that it was judgmental, rule driven, it was stressful and it could feel like another way to fail. So I think when we're talking about active environments, seeing through things through the lens of active play rather than sport is incredibly helpful. Looking at the current state of play, when play facilities are built for teenagers, they're almost always skate park, mooga. BMX track. And when we think back to that first bullet of the draft guidance, the active environment guidance, those are the first three things that are mentioned as ways to facilitate activity. These three things, skate park, Mooga, BMX tracks. When we actually look at these things, what we realise is they're dominated by boys. That is not to say that there aren't some girls who use them, but they're very much dominated by boys. And there's a variety of reasons. It's something to do with design of the spaces. It's also something to do with the behavior of some, but not all boys. And there's stuff around the expectations that we place on girls as well, as communities, as families, as society. I just want to touch briefly on what girls tell us about how they feel in terms of being sort of active outdoors. And a really important point is they feel very highly monitored and judged by boys, by other girls and by adults. And this judgment is rooted in, you know, what is a what is the right behaviour for young women and girls? You know, staying indoors, that's being a good girl. Gender stereotypes around sports and exercise, girls are less capable, shouldn't be doing it. Notions of femininity and masculinity associated by being active. Now, just pausing here, nobody on this call for everybody on this call to say, well, that, that just doesn't happen. But I was talking to a group of young girls in uh, just outskirts of Manchester, and one of the things that they they the story that they told me was a group of them had gone up to the Mooga at the back of school after the school day with a ball they had a ball they were clearly going to have a kick around as they're walking up one of the members of staff from the school comes down he goes all right you're going to watch the lads play football then no sir they said no sir we're going to go and play football all right then so they go on to the Mooga a group of lads already there but these girls are you know they're assertive they know what they want and so they start to try and work their way into the space there's group of them they're going to do this and working their way in working through 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 another member of staff walks past girls girls what you're doing what you're doing stop messing around and interfering with the boys playing football get yourselves home now this isn't something that happened in 1950 this is something that happened in 2021 between lockdowns there was a brief period so you know this is actually what is going on and I think I think it's it's so hard because we we just look at that and go nonsense that should never happen but it it does happen. I think another clear point that the girls make is if there isn't something clear and purposeful for them to be doing, they feel very exposed to judgments as to why are they there. If there's nothing for you to do in the park, 
what are you doing in the park? And I think for some of them, they're worried that they'll be seen to be up to no good. You know, you're hanging around the park, you're up to no good. Um, for others, uh, they worry that, oh, well, you're just hanging around in the park because there are lads there. So you're just like trying to pick up a lad, aren't you? You know, and that sort of judgment, you know, that you're doing it because you're overly sexualized, whatever. You know, some girls, you know, find very, very difficult to manage. Um, and we do see that girls feel a lot more judged for hanging around in parks. And I think it's to do with the fact that you know, is there anything clear and purposeful for them to do? Just a little bit more data there about whether girls feel comfortable and safe in their parks. Um, you know, 49 percent. This is women in sport research done with Yorkshire Sport. Um, much a greater proportion of the 49 percent of girls don't feel safe to exercise compared to just 26 of boys. They don't feel welcome because boys are dominated. Sometimes we have people going, oh, but girls don't really want to go outside. They just want to stay inside and watch YouTube videos about how to do their makeup. You know, there's no point doing stuff for girls. They don't. Wrong. You know, 87 percent of girls want to be outside, but only 34 percent of them, you know, like being active in the park. So I think, you know, there is something that we need to try and tackle here. Moogas, Moogas are great because a Mooga is a space which clearly says, you know, purposeful physical activity in a Mooga. So Moogas are very good because back to that point, oh, you know, if, if, I, if I haven't got a reason to be there, I'll get judged. But unfortunately, they're really dominated by boys. And I don't know whether anybody is, this is just some sort of, very high level stuff that we've done. We just observed a really nice Mooga. It was actually um, the one in Froome in Victoria Park, because I know we've got Annabelle here from Froome. It was the one in uh, Victoria Park in Froome and two five hour sessions, nice weather, Mooga in open sort of use, 60 users, so good use, 57 men, three women, girls. You know, it, it, it's that it's that split and then that's uh use of the basketball court in Brickfields Park um and again that was 10 percent female 90 percent male and I don't know whether anybody on this call is surprised by this or whether everybody just goes yeah that's kind of that's what I was expecting in terms of use that that feels about right yeah that's what that's what I would expect I think lots of reasons. Moogas are very open to territorialization. They're very prescriptive about what you should do there. And there are issues of safety and fear of getting trapped. But of course, those issues of safety and fear of getting trapped do not just apply to girls. You know, there are lots of places where boys and young men feel very nervous about being in a space that they can't get out of. But here are just some quotes from young women using Moogas. Uh, you know, even if I know the boys, I don't, I don't feel comfortable going into her. I thought this was an interesting one. This is from the Yorkshire, Yorkshire research. You know, me and her, they know them quite well, the boys on the Mooga, because we grew up in this area and we still can't go and say, can we claim the space back? And they don't really understand why they can't, but they feel they can't. Skate parks are the other one, the, the other go to. Um, the data there is from Skateboard GB. 85% of skateboarders are male. Um, and that's after there was quite a big uptick in female skateboarding just before 2020 when this research was done. Um, there's quite a lot of data about the way that boys can take over the territory and can drive girls away through exclusion and harassment. And there's also a sort of peripheral effect. US research showed that living near a park makes it more likely a teenager will do exercise. But if it's a skateboard, actually that lowers the amount of exercise. And they did that by putting activity trackers on teenagers. I mean, big scale experiment, but as a, as a principle, quite a simple experiment. Again, quotes from teenage girls. That was a girl, she was actually quite a good skater, but she was skating in the car park. So we said, well, you know, there's quite a nice skate park over there. Why are you skating in the skate park? She said, oh, we're not good enough to skate in the skate park. She was perfectly good. She was as good as any of the lads there. But the boys would just heckle her, so she didn't do it. That's a more extreme reaction. That's to a skate park um, in the middle of a, a larger park. And the girl was just saying, just take it out. It's scary to walk past. You get shouted by boys. I hate it. You know, so we need to sort of recognise that skate parks don't particularly work well for women. 
what do young people say? This is the research from Yorkshire Sport. And the question was, what would help you to be more active in the park? And you know, those were the results. It was a reasonable sized data. Now, the caveat I would say is that, you know, um, locality, the community that you live in, how the area feels generally, the the way that the socio-demographics work around you, these can all impact how people see different spaces. But what's interesting there is multi-use games areas did not appear to appeal to very many of the girls. And interestingly, I have to put my glasses on to read it now, it wasn't that, a multi-use games area wasn't that popular with the boys, you know, and I, I think that, I don't, again, whether people are surprised by that data, but I think we were certainly a little bit surprised that multi-use games areas weren't, you know, favoured by a bigger proportion of the boys. And the skate park, you know, doesn't score particularly highly with boys or girls. So 31% said it would make them more active. So I think the fact that we're giving priority to moogers and skate parks and BMX tracks, again, not particularly high with the girls, 25%, much higher with the boys at 46%. And again, that seems to sort of tie in with data, again, mostly from the states, that these sort of um, sort of new active sports at the moment tend to be very male dominated. So I just want to go back to that draft guidelines on the active environment and look at that bullet point that says formal and informal sports can be integrated throughout the public realm. And then it talks about activity opportunities such as, so it's saying these are the activity opportunities and the first ones that we highlight in this guidance, escape parks, off-road bike tracks, and multi-use games areas. You know, those are the ones that the draft guidance kind of prioritizes. It's the first ones that they mention. And yet we know that those don't work for girls. And that actually, if we want to plan and design for a wide range of users, having as your first three things, skate parks, off-road bike tracks, and multi-use games areas, isn't going to do that. If we put those as our first three, the first things that people come to, then what we will be saying is we'll keep providing activity opportunities for the same group of boys and young men. And it's important to realise that it isn't, I'll just go back if I can, it isn't a majority of boys and young men who see themselves as being encouraged to be more active by those moogers and those skate parks. It's a minority, a decent sized minority for sure, but it's a minority. So I look at that and I think, you know what? I'm sure that we can be more creative in the way that we can integrate activity opportunities into our active environment. I'm sure that we don't have to limit this guidance to skate parks, off-road bikes. You know, I, I think we can just be much more creative. And, you know, we obviously will be, you know, responding to the draft consultation because that's why people put out draft guidelines. It's, it's for people to feed back. But I think that's the sort of point that I hope we can find something that gives people a much more creative hook. I'll just finish very quickly on talking about the centering of teenage girls' voices. You know, they do understand what will attract them to be active in a space um, and recognise that location and intersectionality are really important. I wish that I could sit here and tell you what would make girls more likely to be active in a park is this precise thing. But I can't. We did an example. We were talking to girls in Hackney and uh, they were very aware of safety issues, crime, and they were also very aware of a difficult relationship with the police. It was about the time of child Q. And all this came together 
with them saying, you know, what some of the things we need in the park are sort of safety points, Wi-Fi's, places where, you know, if I go and hold my phone next to a point, a signal will go up that I'm in trouble here, that I'm in distress, that I need help. Um, I want there to be data so that I can keep in touch with my mum because my mum wants to let me go to the park, but she worries that I'm not going to be safe. And I never have any data. I'm always out of data. So if I had, you know, Wi-Fi here, I could just drop her the odd WhatsApp to say, yeah, mum, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'll be heading home, blah, blah, blah. And that would just make things easier for me to use. But there's a lot of focus there. Demographically, very similar group of girls in Bradford, um, but in a very different community. It was a community where, oops, they obviously, they didn't perceive crime in quite the same way. And what they ended up saying was, we don't want any connectivity in the park. Because when we're in the park, we want to be off our phones. And when we're in the park, we don't want the sort of people who are going to be spending all their times on the phone hanging around in our space. So I think location's really important. Seeking out the voices of teenage girls is really important and including boys at the conversation, but do make space to talk to the girls on their own. Just that's some of the stuff of what, you know, what, what looks better in terms of active environment. And I'll just finish there. So apologies, because I think I slightly overran there. Thank you so much, Imogen. That was really, really interesting and very insightful, particularly for me, because I have a teenage daughter who's 15 and I have a teenage son as well. So lots of the things that you were saying certainly resonated with myself. There's been a few questions in the chat box, but just to keep it down. Aren't, aren't you, Matt? Matt's um, uh, kindly joined us in the middle of a move um, to uh, to the Netherlands. And uh, so formerly of uh, Active Oxfordshire and Mac, Matt has uh, worked within sport and uh, physical activity and public health um, and, and journalism indeed over uh, over many years and that this draws on his passion for um, uh, the uh, the underappreciated opportunities for communities in terms of um, connecting people and ideas in in place so Matt has developed his, this work um, centered on active urbanism which is about reconsidering how we adapt sport and play for our urban environment and how we build our urban environments to support physical activity so welcome today Matt and thank you for joining us thanks Simon I'll just share my screen make sure it's all going to work properly Right, hopefully you can see that. And then I've got an entire new setup today. So, because <laughs> I'm actually at my neighbours, because as Simon said, I'm currently in the move, um, move to, ne to the Netherlands. Is that is that sharing, Simon? We got that fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so as Simon said, I'm Matt Roebuck, and until yesterday, I was employed by Active Oxfordshire. Uh, but right now, as I speak up, I can look out the window and uh, removal companies boxing up my things because I'm about to relocate to the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm launching myself from today, I guess, um, as the Active Urbanist, uh, which is hoping to bring insight from the continent to the UK. And this work builds upon my recent Churchill Fellowship. And it's amazing to follow Tim because his book, uh, Urban Playground, built upon some of the work he did in his Churchill Fellowship. And my work here um, certainly builds on both his um, and some of, the, some of the things that he's been talking about and the work that um, Imogen's been talking about from Make Space for Girls. And indeed, um, I purposely skipped over or not included a, a few things that I would have talked about in, in another environment because I knew they were going to be covering it um, so thoroughly and so well. Um, I guess my focus is slightly different in that it's uh, demanding opportunities um, that play shouldn't end, be it at teenage, adult or even old age. And although I've called myself the active earnest, as someone who's worked in county sports and active partnerships in Lincolnshire, Oxfordshire, London, uh, for Sport England regions in the South West and the East, as well as in Birmingham and internationally, I can say for sure that everything I'll cover today and everything I'd talk about generally is, is applicable to from hamlets to mega cities. The difference is how you apply them to challenges that range from rural isolation to inner city decoration. 
And more importantly, it's how you make the most of your strengths or assets that are available in those communities, be that a village hall or be that rooftops. The thing is, when we asset map for active facilities, active environments, often it focuses on traditional sports facilities, facilities like these or these. Whereas as the active urbanist, I say, let's make most of the wider range of assets, those that are more appealing and accessible to the inactive. Let's learn from the true traditions when we, we played in local spaces and we played by local rules. Sport has become increasingly commodified and rather than an expression of community played in the community by the community, it's increasingly confined to specially uh, specially designed spaces behind neat white lines, the kit fence and carpet playgrounds that were shared by Tim earlier, and buildings with little swing gates at the entrance. This othering of physical activity and movement says it's not something to be done here. This is a bo no ball games, keep off the grass culture. Because once upon a time, golf was just some bored shepherds hitting a stone with their crook towards a rabbit hole. But now we've turned it into the preserve of members only spaces that require expensive equipment. So how do we break from this traditional sports? Sorry, how do we break traditional sports from out of this straitjacket of formal facilities? As the active urbanist, I'm advocating for a dual approach, which includes both the adaptation of sport from its codified norms, which made sense at a particular time, but not necessarily today and the adaptation of space to create more movement friendly environments. So let us, particularly as active partnerships, stop focusing purely on built facility strategies and playing pitch strategies, or rather than in those built facility strategies and playing pitch strategies, solely on sport facilities and designing spaces for the technical needs of our product, sport, rather than, rather than focusing on places for our market people and active people to be active. What should our, um, our brief for movement friendly, people friendly environments be? Well, I've got more specifics, but I think they all fit within this triangle. This is my brief. We must ensure that these places are accessible, by which I mean a wide spectrum of, of physical, social and economic accessibility as well as safety, some of the things that Imogen speak pick up on. These places need to be flexible, although I'm told by architects I should really say multifunctional, but I like these all ending in IBL, it's, it's neater. And we should, sh should also focus on creating places that are sociable. And this picks up a little bit on what Imogen was talking about early, on that sociable front, a thought, a thought about no ball games. These signs are typifying a society that characterizes sport and play as an anti-social activity. So how can we help society to recognize it as the opposite? We have to be clear, ball games in locations like this aren't a symptom of anti-social behavior. They demonstrate that for some reason it's more attractive for people to play sport here rather than in those traditional sports facilities the sports halls and the playing fields that I saw that we saw earlier. Whether it's a question of affordability, accessibility, children's right to roam, as Tim was picking up, or safety, or indeed any other barrier. What it, what, whatever it was, it demonstrates an unmet demand for socially acceptable sport and play. Now, in Dagenham, I supported a group of a community group to post positive signage ball games this way signs to make more people more aware of their local activity space. Which of course COVID showed us that not everyone was until they started walking around their neighborhood. But also let's think beyond ball games because we've become quite narrow in our vision of traditional multi-use games areas. When really what we mean is ball courts or teenage cages. One alternative is to create spaces with invitations to play that don't require balls and the prospect of damaged property. These include dance and boxing examples that come from Utrecht and Amsterdam um, respectively. Lots of the images you can see there. But also, again, building on what Imogen was saying, 
we need to include not just invitations to play, but invitations to sit and be. And you'll find these across multi-use games areas and skate parks in Denmark and the Netherlands. You'll see, see banks of seating, interesting swing chairs. And the bottom, that's even a school, a school which is open to um, people playing next to a multi-use games area. But what you can see behind those sticks there is a fire pit. So there's also an element of risk management. And I talk about this more in, in other presentations and on my website, but I'm going to skip over that for the moment. In terms of the invitations to sit and be, the Danes have adapted a theory called legitimate peripheral participation. Now, this discusses how newcomers to an activity or community become members of that community by participation in simple, low risk tasks. So in terms of active environments or sport facilities even, it might mean um, a place where they can meet and wait for friends, watching a practice or a game, rather than being thrown straight onto a court. Think back to that image of the sports hall. Think about any sports hall that you've entered. Where do you enter? Straight onto the court. There's no place to be to become comfortable in your space. So as an inactive person, does that feel an inviting space? Flexibility or multifunctionality, by that I both refer to the mixture of sport, social and sporting, something you'll rarely find in the UK. You know, you have in parks benches over here for people to sit and be quiet and um, sports over here. Where do people rest? Where do people wait to play? But also this multifunctionality refers to elements that might help find funding or increase the availability of local space. This specific example from Copenhagen is designed as a reservoir for those one in one in 100 year storm events. And you may have seen these referred to as SUDs in various developments or planning um, uh, language. And often these have been required to be put into a number of um, any larger build, really. But this one isn't a pond, as they normally are. It's a pitch. And look at my article on the on this buildings aren't just one thing. And you'll find examples from car parks to waste to energy incinerate, sorry, waste to energy incinerators that are inclusive of public active space. Finally, I'm not going to go into active travel today because I know this group has had lots of lots around that. But I do want to say that it has a much greater importance and potential beyond the walking and the cycling itself. Particularly in, and this is to uh, partially quote Jane Jacobs again, creating eyes on the street um, for broader active spaces in this case. And I wanted to highlight this image from Utrecht, um, which I think has some really interesting answers and a few questions in terms of accessibility, sociability and flexibility. And it's part of a, number, a network of teenage spaces being retrofitted into um, Utrecht that are on these walking and cycling networks in order to provide that passing by and that um, social safety. And you'll find me um, adding, again, more ways that you can address this triangle on my website, but I've purposely avoided a few like physical and social safety today as Tim and Imogen have engaged um, so thoroughly with these. Oh, sorry, gone too early. Anyway, so let's move on to the next part of my active urbanist model. And this is the relationship between activation and infrastructure and particularly an establishing and advocating for the role of what i'm calling pre-activation i.e the activation before anything is built we're starting to get funding for activation post infrastructure but i think that needs to come before and again there's lots of this on my website so i just wanted to float the idea here here today and please feel free to, to reach out for me for more but quickly Pre-activation is about taking consultation away from contextless uh, blueprints on trestle tables and engaging in live context-driven activities that help participants understand and demonstrate their barriers to being active and how they might overcome them through better design of our environments and of sports facilities. Um, GAME, a charity that work in Denmark and now across the developing world with young people from deprived communities. Now, their model sees them first developing in the spaces that are local to young people, however they may, like, may look, 
working with local leaders and developing a low cohort of young people who have experience of local barriers to activity. And then they, then they ask them, what do they want from a facility? The first time they did this, they were expecting responses about the quality of the basketball hoops. No longer. The responses that they got were, what's going to be happening in the corners? Will there be somewhere I can get a drink to hang out, chat? Could I do some graffiti on the wall? And their architects realized that what they were looking at uh, and what they were looking for was this triangle. And that, it's, that triangle is actually based upon the brief that game use. It wasn't about the corners, though. It was about sociability, accessibility, flexibility. It was about not being thrown straight onto the court or being able to take a break. And so now they're adapting old industrial units into what you can see in the bottom of the picture, where the uneven steps in the center provide somewhere to hang out, but also be really central to, to the activity, as well as creating space for parkour. And this can be done, this pre-activation can be done digitally too. Again, you'll, you'll, um, on my website, you'll find examples like Traffic Agent, which you'll um, also find in Tim's book, um, which was about um, actually asking children on um, their way to school, um, actually to report when they felt safe, when it was easy to cross, when it was more difficult to cross. And actually they changed and responded and built infrastructure based upon those, those insights. Now, from a more sports perspective, um, City Legends in the Netherlands is focusing using digital innovation where you drive activity through, through an app and actually through real life engagement. But what you do with then with the activity is you, you create this amazing um, real life, real life activity, real life feedback from, of experience from young people who are in their environments and interacting with their environments and can influence how you might want to and how they might want to see you design their built environment. And pre-activation is also a key component of what I, the active urbanist, tactical urbanist approach. Now, this is something I've adopted from similar models that are focused on active travel, but try to reimagine re for active environments. Now, we know that in redesigning our environments to be movement friendly, active environments that follow the active design guidelines, that's going to be a long and expensive process. And we're going to have to convince a lot of people that it's worthwhile. So we need quick wins, something that can demonstrate the potential for this and a world where active environments are the norm, in a world right now where they are no longer the norm and where planning for movement activity is focused on more traditional approaches to built sport facilities and playing pitch. And that's going to take time. And so my model starts with the adaptation of sport, the demonstration, pop-ups that might last as little as a day, but that help people reimagine the world in, as one in which they live where activity belongs. Next, we look to capitalise on that with low-cost engagement and activation and active action research that tests the suitability of an activity within a space. It creates insight into local barriers to activity that might be addressed with more time and resources to then adapt and modify that space. And when talking about modification there, I'm thinking about the modification of things that stop it from being a people-friendly environment. So this might include water, toilets, seating, the safety and hygiene factors. And finally, when that case has been made, the investment in regeneration and movement friendly, people first environments that has been informed by people's interaction and real life engagement, not just a blueprint, a trestle table in a community hall. So how might we apply this to a traditional codified sport? So I'm gonna use Eaton Fives here. An example of a game that started with a few children at Eton College, bored, waiting for chapel, and they created this game. But rather than saying, this is basically hitting a ball against a wall and it can be played anywhere, they codified the sport 
in a way that required this uh, idiosyncratic space, the one you can see on, on the screen, which is a copy of outside the chapel in Eton. And they rebuilt it in India and Nigeria, replicating this worldwide. They, they made it difficult to actually access the facility. Now, back in London, I've worked with the UK World Ball to demonstrate the potential of this sport in the urban environment by taking an by taking an any wall, any ball, any time philosophy. This was the demonstration phase. Now, in the pilot stage, their pilot stage sees minor mod modifications in schools or community settings uh, where they tape or paint out a non-standard space with a non-standard size wall and indeed playing with non-standard balls. At the modification stage, this sees the building of a, of a court on an existing multi-use games area that meets the requirements of an international one-wall handball game, but it also provides access to a ball through a simple vending machine, and there's instructions on how to play. And this is the closest they've got to the regeneration stage, where the space has a real social feel to it. It's got seating. It's on the wall of a shopping centre in Canada Water which provides regular footfall for safety and access to toilets and water for hygiene. Now, this four-step process, I think, can be used both directions. It can be used in a bottom-up way by community groups or advocates like Wall to build momentum and make the case for the value of and investment in movement-friendly environments. But it can also be used by those planning large infrastructure investments, such as British Land, the owner of Canada Water, uh, um, who, is who are currently conducting a massive redevelopment in that rather high area. Feasibility studies need to go beyond the technical. Feasibility studies for any facilities need to go beyond the te te technical. It needs to think about the people that are going to use it, the inactive people. And a pre-activation model of action research that uses these stages can help us to avoid those white elephants that are going to be unused by the communities of inactive people that we are targeting. So this was a whistle-stop tour of uh, the elements of the active urbanist model that I've, I'm, I've been pulling together. And as I've mentioned, I'm going to be working on developing and adapting tools to support the implementation of this. And in addition and to uh, in, in addition to that, there'll be more case studies of some more interesting spaces for activity, uh, responding some of the, to some of the challenges that Image imposed, and even some skate spots um, rather than skate parks that were dominated actually in, in, the, in Denmark and the Netherlands by girls, uh, and France indeed, uh, this one here. Um, as I say, I'll be sharing these via my website. Uh, which is on there, www.activeurbanist.com. You can see my email address. Please feel free to um, follow, uh, follow that. Um, look at my Twitter, my LinkedIn, um, because I'm keen to make this all as useful as possible to people that in um, your situation, which is where I was um, yesterday. And so please feel free uh, to get into uh, touch if there's any topics you'd like me to address there, because that's, I, that's uh, part of the Churchill Fellowship as well. It's, it's, been, it's taking um, stuff from abroad and making it useful um, and trying to influence what's happening back here in the UK. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions, that'd be great. Well, thank you.